the diversity of opinions in the Kronk Feminist Collective really do the work of what I'm talking about. So how do you create that climate amongst yourselves that allow for that, those kinds of highly divergent opinions sometimes? Yeah. Um, I mean, we really talk a lot about what we mean when we say collective. <coughs> so that we're, we don't mean that we all think in the same way. And then we think that part of what it means to get to work together is that we have each other as a community to actually play off of, right, to, to, share, um, to share ideas with and to hold each other accountable. So, um, you know, so that, I mean, look, I mean, my, my blog name is Proctastic, um, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and usually, you know, I'm the person that's like, let's go take everybody back, <laughs> all the time. So if I had my way, you know, you would just see takedown pieces all the time, you know, all the time, right? And so there are other, you know, sort of sisters in the collective who are like, you know, what are we trying to build, we see, like, what is, Know, what is our end goal, right? And is this really going to get us, you know, is this really going to help us sort of with the world that we're trying to produce, right? And so we mean crunk as like, yeah, we'll check you, but we also mean it as like a space of generativity. But part of the thing too is that we have actual relationships with each other and a certain trust so that we can be accountable. And we fundamentally respect each other, right? Um, respect each other's work and, um, and, and give each other the benefit of the doubt that it doesn't, you know, but even when we disagree that it doesn't always that it's, it's not in a bad faith ever, right? That it's a real desire to see the world sort of go forth in ways that are fundamentally more just. Um, but also, I think the other thing to say is sometimes, like, we talk to each other and we like, Lord, this is sort of like being in a music movie. You know, we're trying to figure out, like, is it going to be like new edition? You know, <laughs> is it going to be like Destiny's Child? Like, what's your model? You know, like, sometimes we don't want to evolve. Like, we sort of want, like, we want the, like, new edition and then you can spawn off and have multiple acts and they come back together and still on a great show a few years from now. Because I hear new edition was on a great show. But all these few years later. Um, you know, so we sort of joke about that. But, um, yeah, we, um, you know, when we have, you know, when we see each other um, as resources and we, you know, and, and we also sort of recognize that at the end of the day, the relationships matter more than the labor matters, right? And that's, that's really hard for right, sometimes is to think. So, so it's a, like, the CFC is a bunch of badass women, right? All very ambitious, highly educated, really smart. And we essentially said, like, we could take the male model, which is all about sort of big up the next superstar dude, right? The, the, you know, the next second coming of Jesus, right? Which is how we took it off, which is sort of like our leadership model culturally, right? Or we could say that in the end, we don't think that that model is particularly sustainable. And so rather than competing with each other, um, it's, you know, we'll, we'll, the collective model is sort of more sustainable. So it may mean that you don't have any one superstar rising out of that group, but that what you have is a superstar product all the time, a really good product. And frankly, it's more fun now. You know, it actually is just more fun to be able to do it in a group of people that you respect and that you know how to do and, and, and I think that we spend a lot of time thinking about how hip hop both has gotten this right and has not gotten this right in terms of the models of how they produce work. Um, and, and I think we would say that, that there's a hip hop ethos behind our kind of minimalist, like two turntables and a mic. It's like us and a blog, and we don't have a lot of digital training, so sometimes things look a little interesting. <laughs> but the content is always, you know, pretty solid, right? You know, I I wonder kind of what kind of resources if we're like forming a hip hop feminism for somebody coming in to feminism today. Do you think hip hop feminism is like the best sort of entry point for some, you know, for like a young woman? Could it speak to her own in the same way that it's going to Or and if, you know, if not, then kind of what is that, what is that thing in this moment that's a nice blend of the like cultural context and um, politicization? You know, I, I think really the way to look at that, Brittany, at least for me, is that hip hop was a viable point of entry, mm -hmm. right? So 
I also understood that my feminism wouldn't always be rooted in having to talk about hip hop. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's like this moment where people get really upset that Beyonce calls herself a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, it is very possible that a 14 year old can look at Flawless, hear Chimamanda and Gosia Diche, um, make her way to Chicken Heads, then find her way to Bell Hooks, mm -hmm. and find her way to Patricia Hill Collins. And that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like you embrace the place where people find openings and spaces, um, because the formulation of your feminism is ultimately going to be something very personal, right? So the work that I'm doing now around, the work that we're doing now around, um, so I should say that one of the most incredible experiences um, for me, speaking at, you know, about the, uh, negating that sort of second coming of Jesus model, you know, the dudes kind of do in hip hop, is I, I don't know if people really understand how reciprocal the relationship is and how uh, cross-generational, I guess, Jesus, okay. I am, I am, I'm not quite old enough to be their, their mother, but I am, I am older, significantly older. We spend a lot of time talking to, to each other. Um, some, uh, you know, some of those things are about feminism. Some of them are about things that should never, ever, ever go on record. But one of the, one of the, one of the things that has been really critical for me is how circular and how beautiful that model is. Because while I might have been their point of entry, when I entered the academy, um, the academy is by nature a really like, you know, I don't do well in structures like, you know, I'm a hip hop feminist. I believe in blowing shit up. Like, so going into this place where I sh absolutely created a book that was meant not to function in that place, then to be like, okay, I'm gonna do this work and I want y'all to give me a PhD. I still had to find a model in that that could work. And my model became this generation of scholars who read my work and embraced feminism, but then I, I turned to them, like, I, this dissertation proposal, y'all, like, what is she really asking me for? I don't really, wanna, like, a lot of the conversations are like that, with a lot of expletives. Um, and to kind of, you know, have them remind me um, why my work matters in the context of academia, which I, I don't always see, because I'm busy trying to blow the model up, and, you know, and understand that the work is situated there for a reason. Um, and so the work, the work, my work becomes enriched in a very different scholarly kind of way because of my consistent engagement with these younger scholars who may have decided like hip hop was their point of entry, but their scholarship is just bad. Like I just, I'm, I'm often sitting here, I tweeted as I was listening to Treva's um, presentation, like, I know people say she's like me and Mark Anthony Neal's like intellectual love child, but all I ever want to do is be in Treva's class. I just be sitting there like, why can't I take your class though? You know? Um, and I think that that's one of the ways that a femin that one of the ways that a, a model in feminism works really well, when you understand that it's about the reciprocity, um, and not this kind of, because I, I feel like what I had to come up against in many ways was a very stringent kind of keeping of the guard, you know, of older black female feminists who were just like, I don't know what this is. I don't want no parts of it. I don't like the fact that it's in my classroom. If it's going to be in my classroom, I want to rip it apart because there's no theory. And I basically wrote it being like, fuck you and your theory. Like, that's, that's really... Like I, don't, like, I don't live theory. Like, my feminism exists very much like not in a tower, but on these streets. So what does that mean? Right. Then having to come to Brittany and go, OK, so this affect theory that I said I wasn't going to go nowhere near, like, that might actually work really well in chapter blah, 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 blah. So I think it does mean this understanding of a fluidity and an openness and um, a model that is really much more circular um, than, I th and than linear. Yeah. You know, and it's important. I mean, look, you know, I use your book, many a day in a of conversations in, in my classes, right? Because I think that what, what hip hop feminism, hip hop generation feminism does is give us permission to bring our whole selves to the spaces that we're in. Um, so it, it becomes an invitation to say, I'm not leaving anything at the door.
door, and I'm not gonna give you the opportunity to define what this means for me, right? Um, and so, um, so I, what, one of the things that I say to Joan, which is sort of my approach to the academy, is look, you just have to win the arguments, right? Like, you just have to win the arguments. So it's not that you're wrong, it's just read all the shit they tell you, right? And then be like, here are the reasons why those arguments don't work and these arguments work better. And so, you know, for us, and, and that is also like this thing about, so it's so funny, right, that like, the chicken heads book is supposed to be an academic book, because the thing is, I think that one of the things to remember is, it didn't start out for me as an academic text, but when I got to the academy, and I was in a space that didn't speak to who I was, then it was the book that I ran to, to make space for us, right? Um, and we hope that, so we took some of those same kinds of things we think about the CFC, is that, you know, because folks, you mean, you know, people say, oh, man, she does this, interesting. Uh, but, you know, people will say, well, this is elitist, or it's, you know, or, you know, or how do you deal with the fact that you're academics writing, you know, writing this kind of work? And the thing that we sort of say is, look, we haven't been academics all of our lives. Most of us are first generation. Uh, most of the CFs are first generation academics. I'm a first generation college grad and a first generation Right? And that's true for my wonder twin, uh, Parker Nelly, uh, and some other folks in the collective as well. So we're writing for ourselves. That, you know, so that means that there's a way in which you're in the academy, but not of the academy, right? And you sort of have this foot in the door, but you don't ever feel like you fully fit because you're always thinking about the communities that aren't there, right? And, and you don't have that kind of access. And how do you move among those folks too? So when we write, we're always thinking of them. If a person never gets to step foot in the college classroom, can she come to the CFC and find something that's going to help her think about a situation that she's been going through, right? Um, yeah. So, so that, for me, that's the way we try to take up the ethos, because this thing that you said about, you know, that we don't always have to talk about hip hop. I don't know if we talk about hip hop a whole lot at the law these days at all, right? But, um, but we talk about things in a hip hop sort of way, which is say it's irreverent, it blows shit up, it says that all kinds of things can exist together in the same space and be productive. And those are hallmarks, I think, of the, like hip hop epistemology, right? If you had to say that. So yeah, and I, I, I wanted to just jump on that for a second and talk about the fact that you know, when I'm talk when I was writing about a hip hop feminism as a, I don't know, 28, 29 year old, and I'm now like I'll be 49 this year. So for me, it was also really not so much about the music all the time, it's just like how that particular group of writers that I came up with, like Jeff Chang, um, you know, uh, Kevin Powell, uh, Scott Pulse and Bryant, like because we were hip hop, we just didn't ask for permission to do things. You had to just do it. You know what I mean? Like, I had never taken a journalism class. But when The Voice was like, you want to write a, you want to write a story? I was like, sure, I'll just figure it out. Um, this struck, you know, this, is, this form is not really like how other journalists do their things. But to me, it made sense, because the writing was very informed also by the rhythm and the music. And so, OK, then it became hip hop journalism. You know what I mean? You, I mean? And I think for this generation, um, it's not so much for me that they become hip hop feminism or even they become like crunk feminists. I want them not to ask permission to do their own intervention and their own formulation. You know, it's like I wrote, um, every generation of feminists is handed a bolt of cloth and it's up to you to cut out the clothes that'll fashion it to your own liking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want people waiting around for permission to do that. You have to just do it. Right. You know, and my model was a very hip hop one, like you don't ask you just do it like no one is going to say hey can i be like one of the one of five female journalists uh, hip-hop journalists in the country That's right. no one's going to allow you to do that no one gave us that space in hip-hop you had you had to be like i have a right to be here right. and now y'all got to get used to what that means to have a woman in the locker room so i think that those things are still really very relevant yeah. you know yeah. i don't think you can ask for permission to Claim Beyonce. If you want to claim Beyonce, then claim her, but understand that people are going to challenge you every step of the way. Right. And like you say, then you have to win the argument. Then you have to figure out 
All right, and then you have to be willing to also win the argument and challenge Beyonce at right. the same time. You have to be willing to challenge what you love and call it to the mat and understand that you're doing it from a space of love. Yeah, I mean, you know, our goal is never for anybody who come from feminists. I mean, you know, I said that term to some high school kids a couple days ago, and they're like, what? what's wrong? And I was like, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I know, they were like born after crop was like a thing, so I was like, <laughs> don't get <disturbed. laughs> Anyway. started to do this work, um, first of all, you should know that I went to graduate school saying I was definitely not going to do two things, that my project would not be about hip hop and it would not be about feminism. So one of those things ended up being a bold-faced lie because I'm doing pleasure politics. Um, but I also live my feminism. It's not a thing that just like lives in my head. So um, in a way, I don't know why I was delusional in thinking that I was going to do a project that wasn't about um, feminism. But I did realize that there was a way that like hip hop um, feminism in, in terms of the analytic that I had created still stopped me from getting into pleasure, talking about pleasure the way I want to. Even though I think hip hop feminism has always held ero the erotic dead set, you know, like why doesn't anyone admit that uh, listening to all this in your face testosterone also makes my nipples hard. Like, I think I've always been really honest about that. But what I wanted was a way to talk about women's pleasure that didn't have to go through men or misogyny. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get straight to hard nipples, basically. <laughs> you know? um, but then I realized that there was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing um, in the way that we are taught, black feminist thought, that made a space for pleasure as part of the analytic from the very beginning. So even the way that we theorize, we begin to theorize sexuality out of the context of slavery, dismisses agency or at least sees it problematic or troubling enough that it will get turned into an argument about black women's um, hypersexualization. 
And my argument was, and this is also coming as someone who had to really study African American studies because I wasn't born here. Like I'm a, I'm a Caribbean, um, I'm Jamaican born and I consider myself Caribbean American. So African American history was something that everyone in my household had to like learn. Like we had to like pull some books in and really learn. And my question always on some fundamental level was, there's a reason that the African American experience is so inspiring to political liberation to other countries. And part of that to me is that you survived it. And the survival cannot just be about trauma. The survival cannot just be about a people defined by pain. To me, there had to be pleasure even in the horror of the middle passage or you simply would not have survived the experience. And so my work on pleasure is really about going back through those spaces in black feminist thought and inserting pleasure back into um, the conversation. What does that change about how we think about black women, um, black female sexuality, our relationships with each other, our, our uh, you know, male female relationships with each other, once we say that pleasure is a legitimate and necessary part of the conversation. Um, and I think that I had started to practice doing that in hip hop feminism but I also needed to be able to get past hip hop to be able to articulate a pleasure politic. And that's definitely been a part of our work at CFC, so we don't write about this much now because one, y'all know some of us, and two, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's also hard writing about love and sex and relationships in a really public venue. Um, and, and so, you know, for us, we've always held sort of at center, like that, you know, there is no revolution, right? No justice, right? No promptness uh, without pleasure. That part of what we meant when we said we wanted to hold on to prompt was that there was, was, was something about the kind of bodily pleasure of going to the club and shaking your ass that just can't be captured um, for all the academic theorizing that you might do. That we kept on doing it, not because we were sort of steeped in false consciousness or didn't know better or sought to just sort of live in a contradictory way, but because there was actual joy and actual pleasure and the ability to move one's body and be in one's body in particular ways. Um, and we too said, you know, we kind of want to defy this, this thinking that says that black women can never um, talk about sex. And so, you know, so we really did engage some conversations about sex and relationships and dating um, on the, in the blog space as a way to kind of um, make it clear that we want that to be part of whatever next generation iteration of feminism goes forward. That it's a conversation that we really need to have um, in all the ways we can have it. And so it like spawned one of the things that it spawned. Like after the competition, our comment section was a Tumblr um, called like the Better Pump Correct Tumblr, which you should check out. It's got good stuff on there. It's not heteronormative, which I you know so just so you know. Um, so and then the hashtag. Black feminist sex is the best, best sex, sex ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so part of our goal was also to have a conversation um, with you guys. Yeah. So I think this is a good point in the conversation to do that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I feel like everything that y'all are saying, but I guess like my question.